Teach me about the Great Lakes. Teach me about the Great Lakes. Welcome back to Teach Me About the Great Lakes, a periodic twice monthly <laughs> podcast in which I, a Great Lakes novice, ask people who are smarter and harder working and I'm teaching me all about the Great Lakes. My name is Stuart Carlton and I know a lot about getting carded to go into the casino despite being well over twice the minimum age required to enter the casino and then getting asked a second time hours later how old you are and delightfully saying that you are well over twice the age to get into the casino but I don't know a lot about the Great Lakes and that is the purpose of this year's show and we are live from the uh, International Association for Great Lakes Research Conference at Omaggio's Kildare House in beautiful, yeah, in very nice Windsor, Canada. Harsh, goodness gracious. The river is nice. No, this is a wonderful town and uh, we're so fired up. To be here, and uh, we are joined today with two hosts, not one but two, special live show. First one is the lake lover herself, Megan Gunn. Megan, how's your Iagler been so far? It's been really good. The sessions that I've gone to have been awesome, especially the education session, but I may be a little biased because I was the co-chair, but all the other sessions have been awesome also. That sounds fantastic, and they will not hear you if you don't put your mouth up here. It turns out I lied. Okay. <laughs> all right. And our second... Uh, <laughs> Our second get, or host, excuse me, is Carolyn Foley, Research Coordinator, Illinois, Indiana Sea Grant. Carolyn, how's your week so far? It's lovely. Thank have, you. Have you won big? No, because I don't play. I just use the free parking. Just use the free parking? Yes. Do you sit at the go. machine? This is what I do. I sit at the machine, and I sort of look around expectantly. <laughs> and every now and again, you put in a loony, and then uh, you just wait. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> We're super pumped to be here. Normally, we would have all of this weird artifice... Um, and then do transitional. In fact, we're going to do that this time anyway. But we're live. Uh, we have a guest. But before we get to the guest, we must get to our favorite transitional music. This is about Ooh. the third episode in a row. We're nailing it. So let's go. <laughs> research a feature. A feature in which a researcher going to teach us about the Great Lakes. Our guest today is Dr. Trevor Pitcher. He's a professor at GLEAR, the Great Lakes Institute for Environmental Research in the Department of Integrative, Integrative, Integrative Biology and the director of the Freshwater Ecology Center. Oh my goodness. There are, excuse me. Like I said, it's usually me being an idiot. It's right here in front of my face. I'm staring at the words. <laughs> I really am. Uh, shall I try it again? And <laughs> director of the Freshwater Restoration Ecology Center. Trevor, thank you for joining us live at Iagra. How's it going? It's going good. Thanks for having me today. Excellent. Good. You have yeah. to like pretend like to fist. eat it. No nope. yeah. problem. You got to do it like my that. new best friend. Like, yeah. Like it really is. You know what? We do. I do spray the things. Um, and and uh, and they sit unused for most of the year. So whatever was on them last year is likely still there. Hopefully like, not. That's, <laughs> that's gross. gross. That is true. Uh, excellent. Well, anyway, so thank you for joining. And so far, are you up or down this week in terms of your winning? I'm down in gas money because I've been driving all these people around the river for show and tell. Oh. <laughs> well, let's just jump right in then, Mr. Smooth. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So what have you been showing and telling people on the river then? So what is the river, first of all? First of all, we're sitting nearby, about uh, half a kilometer away from the Detroit River. And uh, it's an infamous river because people have been using this river for sport for fishing, for culture, for fun, for uh, hundreds of years. And we've had the privilege of being a few hundred meters away from it, and I've been taking VIPs up and down the river to see both Sturgeon, the new bridge, a six, seven billion dollar project, and then parts of the wetlands they have never seen before. But we haven't gone with you, so did you take all the VIPs? Well, that's tonight after this. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah. Don't At worry. At least one VIP room. <laughs> that's right. So where are the wetlands that you've been taking them to? Yeah, the wetlands are more towards sort of towards Lake Erie. So heading back towards Lake Erie, there's near Amherstburg, uh, which some of us are familiar with. And uh, so there's wetlands out that way. But I've also been showing them the artificial reefs, the areas where we put out rocks for a bunch of the species that have been sort of disaffected by the shipping traffic over the last 100 years or so. Right, right, and that includes some of the sturgeon, right? Absolutely, that you, yeah. our good friends the sturgeon. That's, yes. that's, it's possible that some people who have done a couple of lakey's things keeps not letting the sturgeon win, but the sturgeon are the best, and we know it. So. No, is that true? Like, how good is the sturgeon? <laughs> sturgeon, they're really good. They've been around for a while. They've been around since the time of dinosaurs, so they're sort of, you dinosaurs. know, before us, so, yeah. you know, they're kicking our ass. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I feel like we might be kicking their ass, I'll be honest. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Not in terms of like longevity, but you know. Like, and they do live over 100 years, don't forget. Do they? Yes. yes. Okay. 
Yeah. How big is the biggest sturgeon you've seen? Uh, the biggest one we've caught, yeah. handled ourselves, 6'4", 148 pounds. Man, just like me. Yep. Cheaper scoopers. Plus 100. <laughs> 100 feet of awesome. <laughs> really? 6'4"? How do you ca- what do you catch it? Is that like a net thing? Yeah, we use set lines to essentially with our partners at U.S. Fish and Wildlife. We catch them right in the river because it's a bi-national effort. We're right on the border. So we catch them with a set line using uh, popsicles. We essentially use dead gobies to catch them. Really? Yeah, uh, they love question. gobies. Okay, I have a question about this. Fire away. I've, so goby, um, round, kind of tubular, right? Yep, small. In the shape of like a hot dog. Essentially. Yeah, essentially. It's like the Great Lakes hot dog. It is like... <laughs> yes, oh, it is. For Lake Sturgeon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've got a... Why not for people? This is my question. Well, once you try it, you'll know why. Well, here's the thing. I'm going to point out Exhibit 1, my shirt. I did notice that. Yeah. Eat Gobi Dogs, it says. This Gobi is my, Dogs, This yes. is my retirement business. I haven't started it yet, but they're huge in Eastern Europe. Everybody su- loves Gobies over there. I suggest you invest elsewhere as well. <laughs> All right, good. So you set these lines. You get the sur- is that just part of a monitoring thing, or is there something specific you're looking for? No. For the uh, Lake Sturgeon, essentially, we've been working on restoration efforts for the last 20, 25 years. And the punchline, essentially, is that for years we dredged the bottom of the river and ruined all their homes. And yeah. so we put back a bunch of space for them. And we, uh, usually in conservation, you have to wait 15, 20 years to see success. But two days after we laid down these artificial reefs, we saw adult spurgeon spawning on the reef. Wow. That's crazy. Two days. Two days. That's, That's incredible. Never happens that good usually. No. That's wild. That's incredible. So what other species are you looking after in the river? Yeah, in the river, you know, the benefit of helping the sturgeon is helps all sorts of other species. So you've got white fish coming in there. You have many other fish coming in. We even have northern mad toms, which are threatened or endangered, depending on where they are. So when you help one species, you're helping a whole bunch of them at the same time. Yeah. Right. So we're sort of stewards, bi-national stewards, uh, with our colleagues in the U.S., uh, for many of these different species. The permitting on that must be a nightmare. It certainly is. I have to fill out CITES permits to hand a batch of eggs four feet away to another boat. Wow. So six, six months of paperwork for a four-foot transition of eggs from one side of a boat to another. Have you ever dropped them? I have accidentally dropped them in the water before, yes. Oh, goodness gracious. Yes. <laughs> Did you run out permits or you, you just sort of no, 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 quite seriously. Yeah, we've dropped you know, eggs in the water on the way, yep. Because the boat's up and down, up and up and up. Yeah. So, yep, right. but we made it work, don't worry. Oh, good. We saved the sturgeon. Cool. Excellent. So if you had to give an award out for a Great Lakes Animal of the Year, would sturgeon win? At least in the last few years, I'd definitely give sturgeon the uh, thumbs up. Thumbs up. Okay, but and what if it wasn't sturgeon, what would it be? If it wasn't sturgeon, I'm going to give the northern mad tom thumbs up. What? Oh, what is so the northern? I mean, it's it's the most catfish. non-charismatic species that uh, people adore. Yeah, it's a little species that hangs out near the shoreline that uh, is highly threatened, mostly because its habitat, again, has been robbed from it. Yeah. Um, but it's uh, cute and ugly at the same time. Cute and ugly. Yeah. Do you only work with endangered and threatened species? There seems to be That's a been the foci for the work we do, yeah. Okay. So we've really moved in on... We do a lot of economically sport kind of fisheries work that pays the bills but mm-hmm. our passion is really with these endangered and threatened species yeah, sure. yeah. I love passion projects yep yeah. passion so, projects keep things going alright so for real I can I, I realize I don't actually know I just sort of go along to get along yep. and so you talk about like sturgeon we totally hose their habitat in mad times too like what what have we done like is it channelized the river is it yep so in the early 1900s just allow these big traders to come through they weren't deep enough so they essentially dredged out the bottom of the river for a hundred years and so by doing that they Wiped out the spawning habitat, so we had a whole bunch of old, really elderly sturgeon floating back and forth with nowhere to spawn. And when you have no spawning, you have no teenagers. So in the last 20 years, we have a, you know, a huge number of partners working on this, and now we have habitats all over the river, and these uh, teenagers, yeah. the future of Lake Sturgeon, are now floating around the river doing well. i got a what 12-year-old. I'm not sure about the <laughs> <laughs> Very what's nervous. This, Give what's time. the spawning age of sturgeon? Pardon me? What's the spawning age of surgeon? Unfortunately, it takes 20 years to mature. So these okay. projects are multi-generational. So, mm-hmm. you know, the funny thing is is that we have people that have just recently retired who started the project. You've got my generation. And then we're now we're mapping out the next generation just to finish the project. So you barely even get to see. Well, I guess no, because they have older ones, right? They do. Huh. But, you know, it takes an entire generation to see the change. Yep. What about um, Mad Toms or Northern Mad Toms? Northern Mad Toms much faster, yeah. They're yep. only two or three years, so they're much faster. So we do see a change in them much quicker. But at the same time, the sturgeon are sort of more charismatic in the area. Yeah. Right, right, right. Especially the baby ones. Very cute. I have hundreds of them in my facility, so, yeah. Okay. yeah. Tell the me only more place, about your facility. The only place you can see them in Canada, to be honest with you. Really? So, really? Yep. so why, well, I mean, other in the wild, I suppose, theoretically. So what do you do in, first of all, tell us about your facility sure. <laughs> uh, in detail. And then uh, tell me why you have sturgeon there. Well, the facility's called, uh, every, every science thing has to have an acronym. So yeah. we have to come up with this acronym. It's called FREC. 
So right. it's the Freshwater Restoration Ecology Center. And we have t-shirts that say, what the F or right. what the freck. <laughs> and so the freck or the Freshwater Restoration Ecology is a, a center underneath the guise of the Great Lakes Institute. And what we do there is we focus on captively breeding endangered fish, freshwater fishes for North America. And so that sounds trivial, but getting them to you know, breed in captivity is quite a trick. And then once you do that, we have to do something else in terms of closing the environmental mismatch between the way they grow up in captivity versus what they're going to see in the wild. Yeah. So okay. there you go. So, how, okay, first I have to acknowledge what the freck is like. It was somebody watching Battlestar Galactica. I think so. <laughs> no, I think somebody, oh. some Gen Z said the, that, and I sort of got caught. Deep, deep, nerd out on that one. Deep dive. Yes, um, exactly. But, yeah, okay, so how many different species are you rearing right now in your facility? So the facility turns over different species all the time. Right now we have two main foci, two species that we're focused on. We have lake sturgeon, and we have something called red side dace, which are endangered in all of Canada and most of the U.S. as well. Okay. So tell us a little bit more about the red side dace. Yeah, what is this dace situation? I see. Oh, well, listen, I brought a prop here. Can you see the prop here? I'll hit the (laughs) Oh, yeah, I hear that. Actually, a dace. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So we spoke with... um, So this is where my show amnesia becomes a problem. Who did we speak with about the underwater sounds? With Dennis, oh. Dennis Hicks? No, this no, was a post at the time. Hicks. Anyway, we actually have recordings of fish underwater in, um, in Lake okay. Superior. It sounds like it might have been a daze. Check this out. It could be. I think. Now let's hear the daze again. Ready? It might be the same thing. Yeah, I think we're on to something. Hey, Pigeonowski, we got you, baby. Yeah, we yeah. do. <laughs> Inside Purdue joke. Sorry. So, <laughs> tell me about the base. Uh, so, is, is that a, so for for those who are not live at Omagio's Kildare House in beautiful Windsor, um, uh, what Trevor's holding up is a a, a dace model. It is about four ish yep. inches. Beautiful looking. How fish. many centimeters is it, Stuart? Well, that would be about ten centimeters. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> and so it's it, it looks like a little trout. Is what it looks like. It does, actually. Yeah. yeah. Little trout. So tell me about the day. First of all, is that a life-size dace you're holding up? This is a life-size dace. So these adults are about this size. And uh, not surprisingly, their name comes from the fact that they're very red during spawning. Yeah. So as you can see here, they have carotenoids on the side. So the way it works is that they display the carotenoids to attract the females. Oh, we all. Well, and, you know, just like your red shirt, you know, this red male is good looking. And so the more good looking you are, the more red you have, the better you do. It's true. Very true. (laughs) We're going to end this line of conversation right now. But so, yeah, dace, of course, <laughs> being the Canadian word for red. Yes. Um, and so what... Uh, no. what, uh, what, 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 are they, what is like their ecological niche then, these little... Yeah, so the ecological niche, so they're more of a uh, stream slash uh, smaller river system fish. But what's unique about them is a couple things. They are important because they jump out of the water and eat fish, so they're visual feeders. They literally jump two feet out of the water. Really? These little four-inch fish. Jump two feet into the yes. air, grab dragonflies. That's why they're red. That's Red's brilliant. coming from the dragonflies. Really? That's our discovery. And they come back down to the water, and they transfer energy from the insect environment to the water. Huh. And the second part is that the first one that blinks out if the water quality is bad. <laughs> so they're sort of <laughs> your sentinel. You don't need to hire expensive technicians, or you don't need expensive equipment. Just ask yourself, is the red side day still there or not? And yeah. as soon as they're gone... Water quality is down the crapper. Really? Wow. And so why are they why are they threatened? Are they endangered? Threat- they're endangered. They're in- federally and provincially endangered. Okay. And in the States, most places, they're endangered as well. Okay. In fact, I would argue this is the most endangered freshwater animal in North America. Really? really? Yep. Yeah, at least fish. There's a couple okay. frogs that beat us, but we don't talk about them. <laughs> There's something called Mississippi gopher frog that kicks their butt, but let's not no, talk no. about them. <laughs> it's barely it's all, there in all It's all fish. So all, it's fish. Like- all fish. All fish. <laughs> So these guys are essentially the most threatened uh, freshwater species Is in North America. Is it habitat cell too? Yeah, they're affected heavily by urbanization. Okay. So all the time the water's warmer because of urbanization, the water's dirtier because of urbanization, and of course the water is more light at night. A lot of light pollution because of urbanization. It's like the people don't care about the things that are in the environment. They just want True, to... True, except for they figure out too late when these guys blink yeah. out, they realize there's big problems. Yeah, yeah. The canary in the coal mine. Exactly, in the fish world. Tasty? I had a chocolate one once. It was very good. You said chocolate? Yeah. Like, so you caught it and then dipped it in chocolate and then... <laughs> We're very literal people Wait, here. Okay. So back to the hotel. Danger, We're going fine danger. here. Everything is fine here. Everything is I good. I was going to ask a question about the light pollution, but then I thought we'd go off on a tangent. No, I want to hear about what's your question about the light pollution. Well, no, it's just like, uh, 
is it something to do with spawning or something like that? With these that guys? Affects, yeah, yeah, yeah. So with red side dace, the big issue is urbanization. So the biggest threat for them is essentially the warming water. So they think about it. Every time it rains in urbanized areas, what does it hit? It hits black concrete. Right. It heats up and then ends up in their stormwater system and ends up in their streams. And essentially what happens is they pass out from the heat, literally. Really? Yeah. Huh. And they live, it's called CT Max. They have a fancy science word. You've got to have fancy science word for everything. Of course. So they have something called CT Max where they pass out and ecologically they're going to die if that water temperature goes up even one more degree. Wow. So that rain hits the hot pavement on a day like today, gets in the stormwater system, and they pass out. Or, gets better, you essentially have washout from rain and all the dirt gets in the water, they can't see their food anymore. Or, gets worse, they keep the lights on all night when they're on the traffic, so they can't, you know, they can't sleep. Right. So they get okay, tired okay. Right. and they get stressed. So all those things add up and it knocks them down hard. So I lived in Florida in the States yes. uh, for a long time and they did a lot with lice in terms of sea turtles and yes. stuff. Like uh, yes. either you have to turn them off or you have to run them out. Are they doing anything with that for days or are they just not? Uh, well, no, they are now. So yeah. the good news is this. Because we have the only captive population of red side days in this country and yours, uh, we are able to actually set limits based on some of the work we do on how much light they can tolerate, how much thermal stress they can handle, and how much turbidity they can handle. So we send that data to the you know, stakeholders in the big cities, and they actually modify their practice. I'll give you an example. In the winter, they used to pump out all this road salt, and now they say, where there's red side days, we're going to use sand in those areas only. Oh, interesting. Nice. Yeah. So this is, you know, what's cool is my students get excited about the science, but when they see the change in policy yeah. in these cities, big cities, we're talking about Toronto, you know, 6 million people, 7 million people, right. they say, wow, my research led to a change in the way they do business. Well, so how's that get done? I'm, I'm always so... Uh, you know, because, I mean, we fund a lot of science and, uh, at Sea Grant, and, and of one of the things we do is we want to fund science um, that is actionable oftentimes. But but it's so often a huge gap between the science that we fund and then, you know, uh, uh, step two, Agreed. sell underpants or whatever. And and so, um, like, what was, the, yeah, yeah, what was the process for something like that? So I had an accidental good idea. Oh. This oh. doesn't happen to me very often. Must be nice. It's very rare. So here's what I did. I said, let's get some of these red side days from a place where they're not endangered. There's only one place in the U.S. I went to Ohio, Ohio. special place. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I love Ohio. I love it, love it, love it all. <laughs> Every part of Ohio. All right, here, Ohio was Yeah, so we'll give them some call. <laughs> Even the red I side days. Not a lot of classic, actually. It's very, no, wait, there's a couple of them over there. from Ohio. They have, the best, they have the best highway signs I've ever seen. I send home pictures all the time of the highway signs. They're special. The ones that, like, yeah. Yes, yeah. all sorts of Louisiana, they got highway signs there. We yes, so I went to Ohio, the only place where they're not endangered, yeah. because there's a bunch of areas in Ohio where there's literally nobody, oh, yes. and they're doing great. Yeah. And I brought back a subsample of them back to here, and I have a captive experimental population where we can ask, in quotes, how much salt can you tolerate? How much thermal stress can you tolerate? How much turbidity can you tolerate? And that information, because what happens is all these endangered species, you can't study them. Yeah. Because when they're endangered in Canada or most of the U.S. and New York, Pennsylvania, you can't even get permits to touch them. Exactly. So I had this ex accidental good idea to create experimental populations to inform policy in very short order. So we go from the research, you know, two years ago to policy change a year later. Wow. So that's we're not bad. talking about decades. We're talking about year. yeah. There's that a never happened. There's a thirst for this information. And the problem is nobody can do it because they're all in danger. So I said, let's find them where they're not in danger. Yeah. Yeah. But of course, the outreach part is also equally important. So the science is important, but the outreach <laughs> is also important. So. Well, it's kind of awesome that you know this is not necessary. I mean, the red is very yeah. attractive, it but it's not, the, it's not the most like charismatic species ever. Definitely and not. people still care enough about it to... They do, yeah. They yeah. see it as an emblematic species for all the problems of urbanization. The lake sturgeon... Juveniles, the babies we have, are super charismatic. Yeah. People yeah. fawn over them. Yeah. Yes. These guys, not so much. They're little minnows. But what they recognize is that they're unique. They're important for the system. I mean, think about it like construction. If you had a construction crew building your house, you need electricians, you need plumbers, you need roofers. As soon as you get rid of one of these, let's say the red side days, let's say they're the plumbers, mm -hmm. the rest of the house comes to a creep. Yeah. It stops. So we have to recognize the importance of the different players in the system. And so when this one disappears because it's too dirty, too hot, whatever, the rest of the system collapses around it. What role does it play in the ecosystem? This one is really unique. Red side days are super unique because they bring in that energy from the insects. So they catch insects in the air, and that energy gets transferred back into the stream system. Okay. And so they're unique in that sense. They're also unique because they're great indicators of water quality. Yes. Again, as soon as I look into a stream, if there's red side days, I know the healthy system. As soon as I look in there, I know it's healthy. 
Do they have any um, special predators that are in these waters? They, they, they have problems with invasive predators. So okay. when we stalk all these salmon in these streams and rivers, these invasive species from the West Coast for mm-hmm. fishing, which I love to do, of course, uh, it's problematic because a lot of them eat these guys. Okay. So there is a kind of a trade-off between the fish we want to catch for fishing and these little guys as well. So there, there's all sorts of considerations for how we protect them. Yeah, we've talked about that a lot. I bet. The salmon question, it's, it's, I mean, it's endlessly fascinating, right? Well, like I said, mm-hmm. salmon pay the bills yeah. in my space, and then I use that money to kind of take care of these guys. Yeah, so okay. No, no, it's good. Yeah, And it's sociologically fascinating. It's something just society can use. Absolutely. Salmon. It's a double-edged, uh, sword, so- double-edged sword for sure. Yeah, anyway, well, that's... That's for a different episode. <laughs> you mentioned outreach a little bit. Can you tell us more about the outreach that you do with your center? Absolutely. You know, the funny thing is, for a long time, when I first started my job as a professor, I got really fixated on the science. So I wanted to get the science done. I wanted to publish the science. I wanted policy to be impacted. And then what I realized really quickly is none of that was happening because nobody heard or knew or cared about Red Side Days. Mm-hmm. So we said, let's take this multi-tiered kind of tiered approach, and we said, let's do this together. So my graduate students, who deserve all the credit, I just kind of like cheerlead them, Mm -hmm. but they are the ones that do all the hard work. They said, let's do this multi-tier process. So what we do at the facility, which is in uh, LaSalle, Ontario, is we bring in these students, about 3,000 a year, and they come in and they either they're high school or elementary school children, and we have a book, a children's book available for the elementary school students. And then the high school students, they were like, I don't care about that. So we said, (laughs) hey, guess what? We just developed a new video game. Nice. And that sparks the interest. So we have a book for the younger children. We have a video game for teenagers. And then, of course, we have all sorts of props to get them interested in Red Side Days. And then we tell them about a local story. So you may not know this, but right in front of us, in fact, by chance. <laughs> what a coincidence. There, there's actually a Windsor Salt in front of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so Windsor Salt is ironically found here in Windsor, produced here in Windsor. And then we talk about the effects of road salt on Red Side Days. And the, the place that produces the road salt is located right under my facility. Really? By chance. Yeah. Absolute chance. Yeah, because that, yeah, the mine would be under there, it's right? It's literally right under my facility. That's wild. So. So that's, and so for listeners out there, Trevor actually brought us a copy of this kid's book. It's called Rory the Red Side Days by uh, Ashley Watt, illustrated by Abigail Kim. And you're probably wondering, how do I know it's a days? Well, listen to this. <laughs> That's right. And Ashley Watt, by the way, is a PhD student who's just about to graduate. And her whole thesis was looking at the different ways to protect red side days in urbanized areas. Yeah, and she and wrote so the children's book. Too. Pardon me? And the, so they get to do that in your lab, too. What a cool They do. You know, and this is a new thing, thing that really has cropped up in the last 10 years because of shows like this and other efforts to communicate that traditional science that we used to communicate only in journals. Mm-hmm. And so this is new for me. I have to tell you, 10 years ago, I wasn't doing this. In the last 10 years, my students said, we need to do this. And I said, I'm here to support you. And they actually wrote the book, and she deserves all the credit. She actually has a new children's book that just came out on Lake Sturgeon. Oh, nice. So, really? Yep. So she awesome. didn't stop at one. She's got another one that just came out. Oh, Great Lakes runner-up, the Sturgeon Absolutely. <laughs> and the best part is these books have been sold at major aquariums, like Ripley's Aquarium is selling them. Wow. The Toronto Zoo is selling them. Awesome. All right. So. Are we, do you want to move to the wrap-up questions? No, not yet, because oh. we have another question. Well, okay. Anyway, well, that's fascinating. I have loads of questions. But. Yeah. Well, that, that, and that's interesting to see how that's evolved over time, and I commend you for sort of running downhill on that, or right, or helping your students run downhill on that. That can be hard. Um, all right, this, so I have one more question, and this one kind of just came up, because I didn't even know this was a thing. Oh, goodness. And, uh, <laughs> now I remember. So uh, we are in Windsor, and one of the more notable features of Windsor, other than the casinos, you have to be 19 years old to enter. You get carded if you looked under 30. Um, Regardless of how old you are. <laughs> Actually, Not that this so happened matter. three times today to Stuart. Um, but uh, anyway, and so it turns out the Detroit River, I did not know this, is filled with dead bodies. Like just nothing but dead bodies. There's like a tunnel to the states and dead bodies. And that's it. And the tunnel has this big curve and we're wondering why it has a curve. And now I'm starting to think it's probably dead bodies. So what are the ecological effects of like a dead body in the Detroit River? It's a good question. It's probably not the main contributor to algal blooms, thankfully. <laughs> but, but what I will tell you is that sadly, uh, what people don't understand, the reason dead bodies are relatively sadly common, is that the rip currents in the river are so high that when I dive there, if I'm not tied off, I'll be a kilometer or two down the river in about five minutes. Wow. Well, that's so, less fun. Well, I yes. It was like hit jobs, which are very fun. Well, if you want some <laughs> hot take, as you seem to like, uh, unfortunately, about a month or about six weeks ago, we had a body show up behind our research facility right between the docks, jammed what? up between the docks. Oh, my goodness. So it closed down the facility for a couple of days, and uh, unfortunately, 
these events are when they do happen they're they're unfortunate but the rip current and I, I don't like to use that term because that's a marine term but the current is so high because the channelization that uh, nobody can swim against the current right. even Michael Phelps if Michael Phelps here he wouldn't even be able to do it is there anything that we can do to kind of I mean channelization is channelization but is there anything yeah. that we can do to kind of slow down that current effect? no but I think the education is the big issue so mm -hmm. people think you know when there's issues they try to swim across we've had many issues from Windsor trying to swim across to the Michigan and Michigan back to Windsor and uh, it's the education piece that way they don't understand the risk they're taking when they do yeah. these things but growing uh, up in New Orleans the Mississippi River is similar probably more powerful potentially about that. absolutely yeah yeah so I walked along the lakefront to get here, the lakefront, the riverfront to get here, and there's all kinds of um, life-saving rings that say, there's like, a reason for that. please keep these here, a, bo or a, body would a life would depend on this thing. Yes. Here, Although, so. I mean, if you're going that fast, I guess you have to look upstream. And, yeah, you, anyway. So yeah. you literally have to throw it about 40 meters ahead of the person for them to get it. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Well, on that note, it's been really interesting <laughs> to hear you talk about the fascinating work that you're doing. Um, actually, it is really interesting, both on Sturgeon, on Red Days, and on everything else in the way that you are trying to uh, be really progressive while still doing very high-quality research, and that is, that, is, that is awesome. But that's actually not why we invited you here on Teach Me About the Great Lakes this week. The reason we invited you on Teach Me About the Great Lakes is to ask two questions. And the first one is this. If you could choose to have a great donut for breakfast or a great sandwich for lunch, which would you choose? For me, it's an easy answer, is it? but the backstory is way better. All right. <laughs> Loving it. So this, the answer to your question, because faculty are terrible at answering questions, so I'll be very direct, is I just and then hammer out the bagel, because when my kids are born, I eat bagels every morning just to survive. So the bagel sandwich, dead easy. There's there a place is. in Windsor called, what's it called? Boss Bagel. There Boss it is. Bagel. This is the second Boss part. Bagel. Oh, is there a second part? It's not. This is Sorry. part two of this question. I so apologize. No, so, so Boss Bagel. So Boss Bagel makes the meanest bagel sandwich you could ever have here in Windsor. So <laughs> I go out of my way to find a Boss Bagel. All right. So, and I have no affiliation. So, but if they want to sponsor me, please reach out. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so what is on the Boss Bagel sandwich? The Boss Bagel sandwich is just something about the most luxurious bacon and egg that I've ever had. So there's something yeah. about it. And they do Montreal style, which may not be familiar to some of your listeners, but yeah. it's a very different style bagel. It's almost like New York bagel. Uh, it's a New York style bagel. But the backstory on this is even better. So the donuts. So when you're a professor and you're bored and you invite your friends over for coffee... My friend showed up one day with 24 donuts, a bunch of professors sitting around, and we started creating a donut phylogeny. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish I was kidding, but I'm not. It's and all so <laughs> we create this phylogeny, sort of like the you know, like a family tree of donuts, and we spent three to four hours making this phylogeny. And the, having like debates about oh, yes. it. <laughs> and awkward, awkwardly at this table, they, they paired the vanilla donuts together and the non-vanilla donuts together, and they had croissants on the other end of the table, and... It got very, very heated about which family belonged, which donut belonged to which family. Yeah. And we took pictures of this, and this, this picture went quite viral when we sent it out into the science community. Look at that. So there's a and lot of debate. Do you still have the picture? Of course I still have the well, picture. Well, then we're going to put that in our show notes. Which I almost tattooed it on my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> can I see your shoulder? No, it's too big for you. <laughs> I get that a lot. You can find that in our show notes at teachmeaboutthegreatlakes.com slash 97, number 97, because this is episode 97, assuming I've uploaded all the... So... I feel the need to admit that the way I used to kind of teach basic phylogenies was with Halloween candy. So it's not like, not that part. but Too yeah, far but it's that. it's not as complicated as twenty four donuts. It no. was like M and M's and what Skittles. Was, the and donut? was there a donut that really gave you? There was the cruller. So yeah, think about this way. That. So imagine oh, a big six foot dining room table, which okay. we had, and all these donuts starting to be spread around the table and moved around, and then we started getting. We had, for some reason, we had pink tape connecting all the different donuts in the phylogeny, <laughs> and the genealogy of donuts became a heated subject for about an hour. And when it got really contentious about one donut, I solved the problem oh. by eating it. Then no longer eat this. Probably I'm, done. I'm here for the donut. <laughs> I love it. So Wait, our, actually, hold on. No, I'm confused. No, no. Our question was, do you want a sandwich or a donut? And you gave us a breakfast sandwich. I did. Yeah. But then but you gave us a story. Donuts. I told you there's a better backstory for the donuts, but I still prefer a bagel. Okay. It works. <laughs> oh, our next question. I chose all the above. <laughs> it wasn't that hard of a question. Um, and you gave us a location to try out while we're here. Is it far from here? No. Nope. Is it far from no, the I got a car just down the road. Yeah. I'm leaving tomorrow anyway. I can go to Boss Bagel in the morning. Boss Bagel it is. EBIM. Ask for the breakfast sandwich. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. 
So the next question is, what is a special place in the Great Lakes that you'd like uh, to share with our audience, and what makes it special? You know, I'm really sad to tell you that the answer to that question is not here in Windsor. That's okay. It's actually in the watershed off of Lake Ontario. There's a river called the, the Credit River, which is very dear and near and dear to my heart. And I work on salmon there every year, and there's times where there's thousands and thousands of 30-pound salmon cruising beside me on the river in the middle of Toronto with millions of people, and nobody knows I'm there. Nobody knows the salmon are there. And we do this research in the middle of Lake Ontario, and nobody has a clue they're there. So you have this urban population of adult salmon cruising through the river, and nobody knows. Wow. And I feel like I'm isolated in the middle of British Columbia because I travel out there every fall, and you would never know it. You never know you're in this big city. So it's the most beautiful place, Credit River in Mississauga, uh, Ontario. Could have told us that before I were last year, couldn't you? <laughs> I would have, but then you would have been there. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Probably not. My kids were there. It was all I could do to just read it. <laughs> Dr. Trevor Pitcher, professor at the Great Lakes Institute for Environmental Research, the Department of in- Integrative Integrative Biology and the director of the Freshwater Restoration Ecology Centra. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me. All about the Great Lakes. And since Paris is here, we'll go with this one. I believe it's a fishing spider. <laughs> oh, Cool. Let's do our uh, thank yous. We have so many thank yous. Uh, thank you, first of all, to our pals at the International Association for Great Lakes Research for having us here. Thank you to our guests in here. Eat more food. Yeah, Drink there's a lot drinks. of food. Because <laughs> I'm about to descend upon it, and once I have descended upon it, it will disappear. Thank you to Trevor. Thank you to Imagio's Kildare House. It's all the sturgeon. <laughs> right next to the base. <laughs> Teach Me About the Great Lakes is brought to you by the fine people of Illinois, Indiana, Sea Grant, and Gobi Dog Media. Thank you. Not on there, but behind the scenes. We encourage you to check out the cool stuff we do at iicgrant.org and at ILINCGrant on Facebook, Twitter, and other social media. Our senior producer is Carolyn Foley, and Teach Me About the Great Lakes is produced by Megan, Lake Lover Gun, and Renu Miles. That's me! Ethan Chitty is our associate producer for and fixer, and our super fun podcast artwork is by Joel Davenport. The show is edited by Sandra Saboda. If you have a question or comment about the show, please email it to teachmeaboutthegreatlakes at gmail.com and possibly tell Stuart that Lake Sturgeon really are pretty awesome. But I mean, you could vote for them. Yeah, <laughs> you can also vote for Red Side Days. I mean, it might be that next year. I'm, I'm so. sensing a, a front runner. Or leave a message on our hotline. <laughs> Have we ever gotten a message on our hotline? Yes, we've gotten some. We just have to pressure the graduate students to do it. All right, 765-496-IISG, which is also 4474. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Teach Great Lakes. But like the you in favorite, absolutely not. I am not reading that line. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for listening and keep creating those lakes. (laughs) 